Today, inshallah ta'ala, we attempt to understand Surah Al-Fajr, Surah number 89 of the Qur'an a little bit better. It's one of the most beautiful spiritual surahs of the Qur'an. And the, the opening of this surah is actually something that there's a lot of debate about what it means. And there are tons and tons of opinions. The most systematic way that I can cover that for you is to in, inshallah not go over the variations of opinions because per ayah there are, or altogether over these first four ayat, there may be at least 30, 30 to 36 different opinions about what they could mean. What I am going to do however, for the purpose of brevity and for the purpose of just academic honesty, I'm going to share with you of these opinions what I find the most compelling evidence and what I find the most reasonable in light of the larger surah, I'll give you my reasons for that. That is not to say that's the only way that the surah has been interpreted, but it's only to say that I, as a student of the Qur'an uh, and as a researcher, this is the interpretation that I find the most compelling. So it's not the only way of looking at it, but uh, I find it the strongest way of looking at it. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. So I begin with that acknowledgement, especially in regards to the first few ayat. But let's first translate these few ayat generically as they are before we get into why that there seems to be some complication. Allah Azza wa Jal begins by a series of oaths. He says, Wal Fajr, I swear by the, br the breaking of dawn, the Fajr time, everybody here knows what that is. Fujur in the Arabic language or Fajr in the Arabic language is an explosion or explosion of light. It comes from the explosion of rocks that, that gush water out. And it's the similar notion of the, the darkness gushing or tearing open and light coming out in the morning. That's the idea of Fajr. But in any case, I swear by the dawn, I swear by the breaking of light in the morning. وَلَيَالٍ عَشْرٍ And I swear by ten, I swear by ten nights. Uh, and they're not specified what they, those ten nights are. And then he says, وَالشَّفْعِ وَالْوَطْرِ And I swear by the, odd, the even and the odd. A shaf'i means things that are in twos, two, four, six, eight, etc. And watr means singular. What that is also used for with the fatha is also used for all odd numbers like one, three, five, seven, and nine. But it can also be mean the, the ones that come in twos and the one that's only by itself. The, the, the even and the odd. I swear by the even and the odd. And the night that passes or breezes by, it penetrates through and goes by very quickly. Okay, so those are the four oaths: the the morning, the ten nights, the breaking of dawn, the ten nights, the even and the odd, and the night that goes by very very quickly. These are the things that we're dealing with now. Why is this so complicated? Well, what is the purpose of these few, you know few things coming together? There are, like I said, tons and tons of opinions about them. Fajr, some say, could refer to the, of course, because Fajr time is when the heart is softest and the believer is closest to Allah and struggles the most to wake up for that prayer. So Allah takes an oath by that that time. Others have said this is referring to the dark era after the leaving of Jesus السلام, for almost 680 years, 580 solar years, 600 almost lunar years, that there was no prophet coming and it was a long night and finally morning broke, meaning Quran came, the Messenger of Allah came وسلم, So some have looked at it that way and then said وَلَيَالٍ عَشَرٍ must be referring to the 10 last nights of Ramadan because that's when the Quran started coming down and then وَالشَّفْعِ وَالْوَتْرِ may be referring to the odd and the even nights of those 10 nights so they made it kind of the interpretation and, and then the night that quickly passes by in other words, the dark ages are over and the morning has now come some have interpreted it that way Though I find some, some reason to accept that, there are other reasons to not accept that. I'll, I'll, of the reasons that I've read, uh, this, this particular one, referring to the idea that Fajr refers to the coming of revelation, has uh, some weight in the Qur'an. Surah Al-Takweer, and also previously in the, in the Juz Tabarak, I forget which surah, Kalla wal Qamar wal Layli idh Adbar wa Subhi idha Asfar innaha la ihda al-Kubar. I believe Muddathir, I believe it is. Right, so Allah says He swears by the moon, He swears by the night as it gets darker, and the morning that breaks open, this Qur'an is the greatest event. Meaning, Allah refers to the night and day coming to the historical darkness and then the light of the Qur'an coming. Similarly, Allah says, you know, وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا أَسْحَسْ وَالصُّبْحِ إِذَا تَنَفَّسْ إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ The night that takes a breath, or the night that gets darker and darker, gets bluer and bluer, and then finally morning breaks out, and it takes a breath, certainly this, meaning the Qur'an, is the word of a noble messenger, meaning that of Jibreel alayhi salam. So once again, night going away and morning coming is a reference to the Qur'an coming, and removing the darkness from the world. But the reason I don't find that as compelling an argument here, is because in all of those cases, the night was mentioned first, and the morning later. 
Here you find Fajr is first, Layl is at the end of the sequence. It's actually flipped order, and that should be respected. That Though on its own you could say Fajr is referring to the coming of Revelation, there's clearly something else going on. Now the other thing that I want to share with you about what I find the most compelling of, of the arguments that I've uh, tried to research on this subject uh, for some time, is that um, the opinion that I'll share with you is actually found scattered among our Salaf, like among the Sahaba, among the early generations, because there were so many opinions, it's literally what I've done is picked and cho chosen a number of them to weave together a narrative, and I'm actually not the first one to do so, the late Dr. Isar Ahmed actually held this view as well, and I found it a very reasonable argument, so that's what I'll share with you inshallah ta'ala, as I get to Walayli Ida Yasr. I believe that these four ayat are actually referring to one of the most important rituals and cultural practices of the Arabs of Mecca, the Hajj. That all of, the, all of these oaths are actually referring to one or the other ritual involving the Hajj. So Wal Fajr is actually the final morning that ends the Hajj event, which means this is the morning of Yawm al Nahr. Okay, so Muzdalifa, the night has been spent. And now it's the day of slaughtering the animal. This actually represents very importantly for someone whose hajj has been accepted even in the jahili times and of course now in Islam we know if your hajj has been accepted it's like you're starting a new life. Right, so that morning actually represents a new life. And by the way, when you wake up in the morning, when you pray Fajr, fajr prayer in the morning, the prayer for that is Alhamdulillah alladhi ahyana ba'dama amatana. You think, you know, praise and gratitude belongs to Allah who gave life to us after He had given us death. Right? So the idea is that once somebody has completed their hajj, they're actually starting a new life altogether. And they're going to celebrate that new life literally with a sacrifice. That's the kind of the continuation of the, the, the sequence of hajj. Of course, that fajr came after 10 days of struggle. What are these 10 days? The first 10 days of the hijjah, which is also find, found among classical opinions of the interpretation of these ayat. So it's the ritual of hajj, the, the culmination of it, and what led to the culmination of it is these 10 nights. Now it comes to al-shaf'i wal watr the, the even and the odd, which is also referenced later on in the Qur'an. The tradition of the Arabs was that once the hajj is done and the, the, uh, the, the sacrifice is done, you remain at least two extra days or three if you can. فَمَنْ تَعَجَّلَ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ تَأَخَّرَ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ لِمَنْ اتَّقَى Quran even says that. Whoever stays behind in Mina, stays a couple of extra days, that they have to at least stay two days, but if they want to make it a third, then that's good for them. So now, two, Possibly three, was shaf'i, wal watr. Others have also, within the Hajj narrative, interpreted these as a shaf'i would be all the even days of the Hajj, and the watr, the single one, the, the odd number that's so important, is because it's ten nights, so it's an even number, right? But one of them is actually really significant, arafa, al Hajj al arafa, like the Prophet says. That's the ninth night. That's an that's an odd night. So it's been it's been kind of made prominent by the word al watr. Also possibly important because the, the, the Quraysh felt that Arafah was on the outskirts. And beyond Arafah, like when you go to Muzdalifah and stuff, when you finish that ritual and you go over to Muzdalifah, this is the, the largest, the longest and the most exhausting part of the Hajj. The night, the longest night is the Muzdalifah night. And the longest day is Yawm al nahr after that. That's the hardest part of the Hajj, right? But the Arabs of, of Mecca thought that they don't have to actually go out there. They're locals, they're exempt from the Muzdalifah struggle. So the, the evening of the ninth, or the ninth turning into the tenth, is actually been given special significance in Washaf'i wal Watr. And then of course, Wal Layli Ida Yasr is going back to the beginning, the night, meaning that last night of the Hajj that's quickly passing away, as if it's making a complete ring. It started with Fajr, and in a sense it's referring to Fajr yet again, that night of Muzdalifa that quickly passes by. Yasr actually means naqab or something to, to, to penetrate something, like a spear penetrating a, a armor is also called yasr or sara, the verb is used. So the idea here is that Allah is referring to these. Now, why did I say that I find this the most compelling argument for this uh, particular surah? There's a few reasons. Uh, first of them is the sequence of surahs that we're dealing with here. You've got this surah, Surah Al-Fajr, and you've got a surah very closely related to its subject matter coming up, Surah Al-Balad. La uqsimu bihadal balad. You've got the time of the year and the ritual that makes this place significant, and then the land itself that makes it significant in the next. So it's got the time and the space, in a sense, that are coupled together in these surahs. That's one very powerful argument. The other argument is if you look at the spirit of Hajj itself, the purpose of Hajj is that somebody leaves behind everything and every status, every responsibility, 
every burden, every pleasure, every difficulty, they've left everything behind and they come before Allah in a sense spiritually naked. In a sense, nothing is, I mean we're all dressed like we're dead, we're basically dressed like we're supposed to be buried, and we come before Allah Azza wa Jal with no distinction between ourselves, no color distinguishes us anymore, no status distinguishes us. Unfortunately, nowadays it does. There's the VIP package and then there's the, you know, the, the, the poor guys that have their tent out on the rocks that are about to tip over package. But the spirit of Hajj is supposed to be everybody's absolutely equal. There are no VIPs. That's the point of Hajj. And it's supposed to replicate when we are going to come back in front of Allah on Judgment Day. That's the point of Hajj, is to actually do a rehearsal of what's going to happen on Judgment Day. Allah will make a call and we will all say labbaik, we will respond to His call. Right? So we're voluntarily coming before Allah as a rehearsal of what we're going to be doing when we come before Allah uh, on Judgment Day. The reason I find this the most compelling narrative is when you study the end of this surah, Allah says, يَا أَيَّتُهَا النَّفْسُ الْمُطْمَئِنَّ اِرْجِعِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَةً فَادْخُلِي فِي عِبَادِي وَادْخُلِي جَنَّتِي And in many ways that's actually a depiction of Hajj itself. A content soul, a content person coming back to Allah, literally when Allah says, come back to me, and we say, here I come, what's the Arabic word for here I come? Labbaik, it's responding to irji'i ila rabbiki. And when you're done with hajj, you're completely content because your sins are forgiven, you've got a fresh slate on life, you're radi and mardi before Allah, crying before His haram, you, you know, leaving all of your sins behind, leaving all of your grievances behind, your sadnesses behind. And then Allah says, Fadhuli fi ibadi, enter into the midst of my slaves. When in your life will you be in a bigger gathering of the slaves of Allah than hajj? And that's actually a mimicking of the slaves of Allah that are going to be entering into Jannah. And then what Khulij, and therefore, if your sins are in fact forgiven, you're going to be entering Jannah as well.